Okay, our next two speakers are Rhonda Miller, and Rhonda understands what it's like to live with the family disease of addiction. While working on recovering from the effects uh, from, of being raised by parents with active alcoholism, Rhonda faced the heartbreak of watching her youngest son struggle with addiction to opioids. Rhonda channels her pain into helping others. She founded the nonprofit Speak Up for Ben, Incorporated, and the Oasis Community Center, the first recovery center in Pennsylvania exclusively devoted to supporting families impacted by substance use. If you haven't been over to see Oasis, if you ever get the chance, it's a beautiful, beautiful, warm, safe space. I always tell Rhonda I'm gonna come bring my computer over there and work. Um, Rhonda is credentialed by the PCB as a certified family recovery specialist, by grief expert David Kessler as a certified grief educator, and by the Grief Recovery Institute as a certified grief recovery method specialist. Rhonda uses her expertise to help families find hope for their own personal recovery from the effects of a loved one's addiction. And the second speaker this hour is Caitlin Stahl. So um, family, she is with Families Obtaining Recovery Together or FORT. And that is a program offered by Mid-Atlantic Rehabilitation Services, known to many of you as MARS. FORT uses both an ecological and peer-based model to provide recovery services for family members who have a loved one with a substance use disorder. Services include individual and family counseling, group therapy case management, and assistance from certified family recovery specialists. FORT coordinator, Caitlin Stahl, will share more information about these much needed services available to Lehigh Valley families. So first let's welcome Rhonda. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Great to be in person again. Uh, as Lisa said, my name is Rhonda Miller, and I am in long-term recovery from the effects of the family disease of addiction. Beginning with my growing up years, with my parents' active alcoholism and mental health issues, and then later, as I was raising a family of my own, my youngest son, Ben, developed an opioid use disorder, and I journeyed alongside of him for eight long and arduous years, helping him, supporting him to find recovery from that very same disease. Today, I'm going to share my journey with you through the eyes of a mother. My hope is that by learning what families experience, you will feel more compassion, you will speak up to break the stigma, and you are better equipped when you leave to help families by sharing resources, pointing in the direction of help and offering hope. Now I'd like to introduce you to my beautiful son, Ben. This is my Ben. He was raised here in Bethlehem. Happy kid, full of joy, just the joy of my life. He was sensitive, caring, very creative, musical, and you would never know in his growing up years that there was anything brewing underneath the surface. He kept a beaming smile on his face, making everybody happy who he encountered. Um, he excelled in school, and he was an athlete with aspiring dreams to become a professional soccer player. He also was an accomplished musician self-taught keyboardist and guitarist and helped found a popular band in the region here. He was an industrial, industrious worker. In fact, it's really special for me to be here today because he was a server right here in Hotel Bethlehem in the 1741 Terrace restaurant and served events like this one that we're at today. So it's very special to be here. But, Social anxiety, I believe, was brewing underneath. He kept it well hidden. He had um, a number of traumas in the public school system at the high school level with uh, gang activity that was very, very traumatizing and bullying. Um, so we don't have a clear understanding of everything he experienced because he didn't share those details with us. But we know that there was some, some trauma he experienced there. 
we, uh, the first speaker talked about sleeping and how sleep was a way to ease pain and to not feel those feelings. When Ben was a te teenager, he slept a lot. And a lot of teenagers sleep a lot, but it was a problem. He couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't get him to school. I got phone calls from the school, threatening letters uh, from the truancy officer because I could not get him out of bed and the school and all the experts could not figure out what was going on. Oh, he's drinking too much Red Bull at night. Oh, he's having too much sugar. He needs to do this. He's watching uh, the computer and the stimulation. But nobody really understood that there were some deeper issues going on and connecting the dots. So anxiety, I believe he, he suffered with, and I believe he suffered with depression, but he kept it all well hidden. Some of the warning signs that I observed, and I want to point out to you, especially those that are working with young people, um, such as adolescents and, and young adults, uh, his grades dropped. He was a 3.5 GPA honor student, dropped to a 1.0. Teachers never commented. Counselors at school didn't have any answers or solutions. It was very disturbing not be able to, to get to the root and help him. Appearance changes. He, he changed his image. He started dressing differently. Hygiene often will suffer and a change in friends. So he made a lot of shifts during this time, but it is a time for exploring as a young person. So some of these things people may not be too alarmed with. Lose interest in hobbies. Ben was an aspiring soccer player. He even transferred from his small private school to the big Liberty High School because he wanted to play on their soccer team. That's where he expected uh, to be recruited, to be noticed, to gain attention of scouts for a scholarship. He had plans to go on to college, play college soccer, and maybe professional soccer. He walked away, walked away from the team, walked away from his dreams. That was a big red flag. And we talked about sleep. I noticed he was withdrawing from interacting physically with a lot of friends. And we're seeing this in today's world too. High engagement on computers, on iPads, iPhones, social media. Kids are spending more and more time isolating. This is a concern. This is a big concern. Um, so these are some of, the, some of the things that we noticed. We also have a family history of addiction and a family history of mental illness. So these, coupled with all the other experiences that we were having, were pointing to some serious problems. During this time, the physicians, the psychologists, the psychiatrists that were working with us, with our family, with Ben, they weren't connecting the dot. Today, things are changing, and that's good news. Addiction and mental illness. We talked about this earlier with the other speakers, that mental illness is often co-occurring with addiction. In fact, some of the statistics that I see quoted regularly, I think are way off because people are not honest. They're not going to report what substances they're using or how much substances they're using or what degree of mental health issues they have. People are not always honest. So the data that's collected, the statistics that are reported are underreported in my opinion. I believe that um, addiction has, is, is, uh, goes hand in hand with some kind of mental health issue. may not be a serious one, but even, even anxiety and low level depression that pe people battle with. Substance use disorder is a medical disease. It is a brain disease classified in the DSM-5 as a mental disorder. And it does not discriminate. Our son grew up, many would say he was a child that grew up a privileged life, middle class community and neighborhood, beautiful um, school that he attended, faith-filled family, supportive community. And yet addiction came to our home. Addiction came to our home. It does not discriminate. Addiction is complicated. It's multifaceted. I constantly uh, deal with the stigma that I experience. Pe people tend to classify people that suffer with addictions 
in all kinds of categories that are unkind, unkind labels, unkind labels, but it affects the body. It affects the brain chemistry. It affects the mind. It affects their thinking. It affects the spirit, the will, the drive, the passion, all of these areas. There's not one area that's not touched. We can help eliminate the stigma. You can help by changing your language. Today, we're moving away from language such as describing my son Ben as an addict. I would not describe my son Ben as an addict. My son Ben was a beautiful person who lived with a substance use disorder. We must change the language, people. Using, uh, using language like that can be very stigmatizing for the person suffering and their families. And I know that within some rooms of some, uh, you know, 12-step programs that, that that's appropriate, but we as a community should not be using that language. I'd like to share with you some of the ways addiction affects families. I'm here to speak as a family member. I was sandwiched with it between my parents' crazy alcoholism active my whole life to this day, they're in their 80s, with a mental illness that was never treated, never addressed, never even acknowledged by them, to moving away from that, raising a child, thinking, I'm going to make a difference. My family is not going to experience what I had in my childhood. And yet, my youngest boy developed a horrific addiction to opioids. Conflicts erupt naturally. There's lying, there's deception, trust erodes, communication breaks down. This creates all kinds of fear and trauma. I cannot tell you how much trauma I have experienced as a result of my son's addiction. I was already traumatized growing up in a home with untreated, unacknowledged, active alcoholism. But then watching my baby and, and all, the, all that went with that, it was devastating and traumatizing. It created a deep anxiety in me. I still live with that today. It created a depression. It threw me into a major depression at the height of his opioid addiction. I struggle to this day with depression. And that throws us into isolation because guess what? People don't understand. They don't want to hear about it. You have lunch with friends. You're talking about their kids getting scholarships, married, travels, careers blossoming, families blooming. That's not happening for us. So guess what? We just don't associate. We withdraw and we isolate. So many secondary losses. Watching our son lose his dreams for a soccer career, his dreams for college, his dreams for a successful career in business. Watching our hopes for him to find a, a love to marry, to have children of his own, to have grandchildren, watching all of these dreams fall by the wayside and dissipate. So painful. And so I lost dreams. I lost hope. I lost relationships. So many don't understand. There's such stigma, such stigma. People distance themselves. You got going, that going on in your household? There must be a problem. What did, that, what did those parents do wrong? What's going on in that family system? We're going to stay away. Friends pull back. Neighbors run the other way in the supermarket. Even relatives disassociate. So we all lose that support system that one time we had that was so critical to get us through. Families experience stigma, and this is why families don't get help. Families don't go running to the doors of Al-Anon. <laughs> if you walked into the 12-step rooms designed for families, Naranon, for example, meets over at St. Luke's Hospital. I attended those meetings. 
maybe 20 people at the most in any given meeting when there's thousands of families impacted here in the valley. And that's typical of all these meetings. Families are terrified of, of asking for help. I remember the first time I went to a meeting, it took months for me to get the courage to get in my car and to walk in the door. It's so painful. So you can help. You can help families by openly having conversation, by not hiding, not avoiding, not changing the subject. When somebody says, I lost my child to addiction, that's really uncomfortable. And oftentimes when people hear that, they wanna run the other way. They don't wanna keep dialoguing. So they'll change the topic or they'll dismiss themselves. I just encourage you, embrace their pain, walk alongside of them. This is how we break the stigma. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit. We already covered this earlier with the other speakers about the uh, drug crisis here in the Lehigh Valley and the nation. As she pointed out earlier, Amy, we've had over 107,000 drug-related deaths nationwide in the year 2021 alone. Those are preliminary data. Uh, that is, I will say, underestimated. Again, that's reported and not always is it reported accurately. These numbers have broke all historic records, all historic records. In the Lehigh Valley alone, Northampton County and Lehigh County in 2021, we had 994 accidental drug-related deaths, accidental. And over 68%, well over 68% is attributed to the synthetic opioid fentanyl that is rampant on the streets. And in today's world, that's pretty much all that's found on the street. Fentanyl, this is something that I am passionate discussing because it's killing generations of young people. I hear it every single day. 12 year olds, 13, 14, 15, 17, 25, fentanyl. They think they're getting a Percocet pill or a Xanax pill. They think they're gonna just get something to help them get through that exam or that troubling time. And it's laced with fentanyl, if not 100% fentanyl. 50 times more potent than heroin, 100 times more potent than morphine. And today, we're seeing a new trend. Rainbows, colored candy-like pills. They're compressed and they're made of 100% fentanyl. This is alarming. We need to wake up. There's something that we need to do. And it's going to take more kids out. It's going to take more kids out. We have to be on top of this new trend. One pill can kill. That's a slogan that I want you to remember. One pill can kill. You need to communicate that, especially to kids, middle school, high school, college kids. They are buying pills on the street and they're being poisoned. Oh, by the way, speaking of poisoning, I have something to say. Language matters. And when you learn that somebody died from a product that they thought was Xanax, Percocet, even heroin, but it turned out to be fentanyl, that is not a drug overdose, folks. It's not. That is fentanyl poisoning. Social media is the new drug dealer. This is where kids are accessing these drugs. They use apps. Snapchat has been a popular one because the conversations vanish and are undetectable, not able to be traced. Dealers advertise using all kinds of emoji codes. Here's a sample of some of them. There's a vast vocabulary of emoji that's continuously developing. And it's a trend we need to be on top of. I want to encourage all of you to do some research and become educated. If you have interactions with young people, if you have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews, be aware. Watch for those emojis to make a difference and save their life.
Now I'd like to talk about my Ben, a little bit about the journey that we experienced as a family. As I said, he, he was a normal, happy kid, experienced some trauma in the school setting. We got him help, psychologists, psychiatrists, family counseling, all kinds of assistance, and yet couldn't really get to the root. At age 17, he had his wisdom teeth removed. And, and I said to the doctor, no strong pain meds. This was about 2009. In that era, it wasn't common knowledge in the general public about opioids and all the specifics. I just said, no strong pain meds. Well, they botched this surgery. He had to have a second surgery and then they prescribed him Vicodin. Don't know if that's where it started for him, but it certainly didn't help. He, he took that Vicodin and he developed a serious opioid addiction, landed him in the local hospital here in the emergency room. And they did an evaluation. They said, your son needs a mental health evaluation. Your son also needs intensive outpatient treatment at the age of 17. Here's what we recommend. First things first, went to get a mental health evaluation. They, they met with Ben, they talked to him. They said, Ben, we believe you are suffering with mental health issues, but we can't help you. You have to first get your addiction under control. You got to stop using drugs because we cannot get to the bottom of your mental health issues while you're using drugs. So go see intensive outpatient, deal with the drug problem first. Ben was prescribed Suboxone for the opioid addiction. Keep that cravings manageable. Then we attempt, we reached out to a premier addiction specialist here in the Lehigh Valley to seek treatment for him outpatient care. They denied him outpatient care because he was on Suboxone. I was told, your son is still using drugs. Until your son stops using drugs, we cannot see him. So we turned to the doctor that was prescribing the Suboxone. Get Ben off of this Suboxone. He needs to get into treatment. Nobody will help him until he's not using drugs. So the doctor, cold turkey, took him off Suboxone threw Ben into a deep and hard withdrawal and Ben turned to the streets and that's where he was introduced to heroin. Over the course of eight years, Ben struggled tremendously with going inpatient. The inpatient experiences he had were not positive and helpful and he resisted going, but he did complete. 10 rehabs, stays inpatient. And then he was admitted to his 11th rehab. He was prescribed by uh, Vivitrol at that point. Uh, the doctor was going on vacation when Ben was due for his 30 day injection of Vivitrol. And they didn't line up another doctor because there was very few authorized to administer it. So Ben had to wait a week before he could get that Vivitrol shot. While he was in his 11th inpatient rehab, it was a 90-day program pre-approved, 45 days in, the insurance company looked at his notes from the clinicians. They said, your son is doing so well. Ben is doing so well. He no longer needs this level of care. That's it, we're done, we're not paying anymore. Prematurely discharged, out he goes. He was released to a sober living home nearby, so he could still attend outpatient programs through the treatment center. But no Narcan was allowed on the premises. The clinical director said, of course not. That would encourage use. No, thankfully times have changed. Six weeks later, Ben had a relapse and this time it was fentanyl 100% and took his life. He was 23 years old one week before his 24th birthday. This was August 1st, 2016, six years ago. I cannot begin to communicate to you the devastation this has caused. Me, my husband, our surviving son, Alex, our family, we are reeling to this day from the pain and the questions and the what ifs, and the woulda, coulda, shouldas, the guilt, 
the shame. I say it's false guilt because there's really nothing we did or didn't do that would have changed the outcome. But nonetheless, parents carry it. We carry guilt, we carry shame. We carry shame because the community shames us. So I'm asking you to join me in changing that attitude and that conversation. When I lost Ben, my life was over. I humbled into the deepest, darkest depression, major depression. I was not very functional, could barely get out of bed, could barely do the basics of self-care. And this lasted several years. I had no support. My husband's family turned their backs on us, cursed us turned away. My family didn't come to the funeral, didn't acknowledge Ben's death. Friends disappeared. It was so isolating, so isolating. I did see grief support groups right away. I, in fact, I went to the very first grass meeting two days after Ben's funeral. So I knew, like, what do I have to do now? What do I have to do? This is my life. What do I do? Two years in to this depression, two and a half years, in, I started to, I was researching the opioid epidemic. I was focused so much on helping my son that I didn't see the big picture of what was going on in the pharmaceutical industries. What was going on with the over-prescribing practices of physicians? What was going on with the physician that was prescribing Ben opioids that was just recently in a paper for being arrested and thrown in jail? I was so focused on surviving and trying to help my son. But then during my grief, I started researching. I started understanding. I joined a protest at Purdue Pharmaceutical Headquarters with hundreds of other parents and families like me. That's when the things shifted for me. I got in touch with my anger inside at what has happened to our family that was absolutely preventable. That should have never happened. I pulled myself out of that depression and I started engaging in advocacy work, going to various marches, uh, marching against Purdue Pharmaceutical and other, other organizations. Then we found our voice, our family. We found our voice and we started speaking up. We founded a nonprofit. We named it after Ben. Speak up for Ben. Speak up for all the Bens in the world. They're all out there. They have difficulty finding their voice, been at great difficulty advocating for himself. We now are Ben's voice. We speak in the community at events like this. We hold events and we're making in our own small way shifts and change. We're raising, the raising awareness of the dangers of opioid misuse. I say misuse because there are legitimate reasons that people need to be prescribed opioids. But we raise awareness. We're shouting from the mountaintops. We're trying to remove the barriers so that people get help, that they're not filled with shame, so that families can release the blame and guilt and get support that they need. We established a project over at Steel Stacks ArtsQuest campus in Bethlehem during the month of July, we call it Angels of the Valley Banners. They feature hundreds of beautiful young people from our community here with little biographical sketches of who they are. And when you approach this exhibit and you don't know anything about it, it's mind blowing like, wow, who are all these beautiful young people? Wow, look at them. And then all of a sudden the dots are connected. And you realize, oh my gosh, all of these young people from our community lost their lives to opioids and other substances. They lost their lives. It's a powerful, powerful way to reach the community. We established a scholarship fund. We're blessed here in the Lehigh Valley to have the first faith-based recovery high school in the nation, Colby Academy. As soon as I heard about this organization, I was the first, I would have signed up Ben, he would have been their first student. 
And we advocate and support that organization wholeheartedly. It is underutilized. They have two students right now, two to four, four two are in treatment. Th this room, the, the high school should be filled with students. We know there's an epidemic amongst high school students with drug addiction. And then close to my heart is family support. Because during Ben's addiction, I saw the need to focus on him and to focus on the people suffering with the addiction. But I also noticed there was virtually nothing for families. They would just say, go to an Al-Anon meeting. That was the solution. Every treatment center, go to an Al-Anon meeting. That's not enough, folks. It's not enough. So I was very blessed and fortunate to start networking here in the Lehigh Valley and with Northampton County Drug and Alcohol Division. And I received the support when I shared my vision that families need help. Families need to recover too. I believe addiction is a family disease. And I believe if the family system begins to recover together, the person with the addiction has a stronger chance of sustained recovery. So with the blessing and support of Northampton County, we open the first family recovery center in the nation, right here in Bethlehem, the Oasis Community Center. Um, I have a short video here that I would like to show you if, if it's possible, one moment. Uh, so we're, we're in a beautiful 220 year old historic farmhouse on the Monocacy Creek. We're right up the street, 10 minutes at the intersection of Route 22 and 512 Center Street in Bethlehem. And it's a beautiful home. I invite you all to come to visit, to see what it's all about. There's programs for everyone. I have a short one minute video to show you. Oasis, a peaceful area in the midst of a difficult, troubled situation. Oasis, healing center for families so that they would have the support to cope with their loss. The Oasis Community Center, an example of community leadership taking their profound, unimaginable grief and directing it in a positive way that will bring some measure of peace and comfort to other families. We are not giving up on anyone. We are not giving up on anyone. It's a picture perfect setting for us to experience healing in community. Opportunities, activities, support, information, serenity, an oasis. Creating this program with the support of Northampton County is my life purpose. This is what I live for, helping other families and friends and people in active addiction. They all come to our center. I'm gonna talk very briefly about some of the programs that we offer. We have a, a approach through a trauma-informed lens. All of our programs are trauma-informed. So we do host groups such as Al-Anon uh, and adult children of alcoholics. That's where I found recovery in the beginning, but we've developed our own programs. We've developed trainings dealing with wounds, dealing with trauma, mental health first aid training. Uh, we host NAMI's family to family program because we understand the connection of mental health issues. We have uh, contracted two licensed professional counselors to run groups, one for families with active addiction and their loved ones, and another one for families like mine who have lost their loved one. We've developed evidence-based training programs. We believe that there's multiple pathways for recovery. We do not believe in tough love. We do not believe in allowing the loved one to hit rock bottom, because guess what, in today's world with fentanyl, that means death. So we have several programs that we've developed that we're working with, um, grounded in science, compassion and kindness, invitation to change, and smart recovery groups. We now have four smart recovery groups and we have groups for people 
in recovery from addiction. We partner with the CHC. They're very, very actively connected with us. They provide drug education programs for us. They provide uh, grief programs for our children, uh, Narcan training and distribution, and the mock teen bedroom. My heart is supporting the bereaved community. That's where my heart is very close to, because I know from interacting with hundreds of families, both in person and virtually, that families that carry this pain are vulnerable to develop addiction themselves. They're vulnerable to abuse, alcohol, drugs, any number of substances or activities to escape the immense pain. So we believe that our work with families who are grieving is prevention. So we all have a, a grief group that's open to everyone. And then we have certain demographics. We have one with children, children who have lost a parent, one or more parents to overdose or fentanyl poisoning. We have groups for the siblings. I call them the forgotten grievers because they're completely overlooked. They lost a brother or a sister. We have groups for caregivers, the grandmothers largely, who are raising little kids now because their adult children died. And now they have the responsibility of parenting again, small children. They need a lot of support folks. We have memorial events, a butterfly release in the summer. We have a holiday remembrance event. Holidays are very painful for families. We're very alone. So these are important activities. This year, we launched our first respite retreat for women who have lost a loved one in the opioid crisis. Women need support. Families need support. Emphasizing wellness and self-care because when we're fighting alongside our loved one for their life, we often lose sight of our own self-care. It falls by the wayside. That's what happened to me. And I lost my health, folks. I lost my health. So we have trauma-informed mindfulness. We have meditation. As it was discussed earlier by Heather, movement is so important. We got to get the pain out of our body. So we have movement classes. We have yoga. We have meditations. We, have, we develop trails in front of us along the Monocacy Creek to do some small hikes and meditations. So what can families do? What can families do when you're thrown into this situation and you don't understand what's going on? Get educated. Get educated, learn as much as you can about substance use. Families oftentimes will look the other way, busy themselves, they're in denial, head in the sand. Learn, educate yourself. Find resources on co-occurring opportunities and options for treatment, co-occurring. Paramount is self-care, paramount. I always use the analogy of the oxygen mask in the airplane. We have to treat ourselves and care for ourselves first if we're gonna be able to help others. Join support groups, network, talk to other families, learn from others, go to professional counseling, individually, yourself, and with your family. Attend community events like this one. We have them all over the Lehigh Valley and thanks to the virtual world, we can access them all over the nation. Learn how to navigate systems. Learn, if your child is in school, learn about what opportunities they have to work with your child because there wasn't, there wasn't options for my child. Things have changed and they're changing. Learn about the healthcare system, learn about the insurance system. And best of all, learn about what our amazing counties offer. I had no idea the resources that Northampton County offers the community. I had no idea, I wish I had known that. I wish I had known. Maybe they weren't offered 10 years ago, 12 years ago, but they're offered today. So educate yourself on the resources of Lehigh County and Northampton County and support one another. Families need recovery too. When people say, you know, they talk about being in recovery, it's often not considered that we need to recover too. And find or build a supportive community for yourself. Families heal together. Here's Miss Sandy with our, she runs our, our group on the left for our children who lost a parent or both parents to drug poisoning. We have siblings in the middle, they form connection where they felt like outcasts in their peer groups. And on the right, we have a handsome young man that was raised since infancy by his grandmother 
who's standing with him doing equine therapy. We support all of them and we can heal together. These are families that come to our center for healing. In the middle is one of my favorites because this is the Colby Academy kids. We host them every quarter for a special fun event. And it's a blessing to watch them grow in their own recovery. I leave you with this. There is always hope and help for families, always. Even though my story is a sad one, there's hope. There's hope for my recovery still. I will never, never get over the loss of my son. Every day I live with that pain, but I can recover too. In fact, I'm gonna share a verse with you. It's very special to me when I came upon this verse it's basically the description of my life's purpose now. He comforts us in all our troubles so that when we can comfort others, when they are also troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. So through my pain, through my tragedy, I have received comfort and help and healing, and I share that freely with others. Thank you so much for letting me share. Good morning. My name is Caitlin Stahl, and I am here with Mars. Um, and I am presenting about the FORT program, which Lisa stated that it stands for Families Obtaining Recovery Together. Um, just like Rhonda had, you know, told her story, um, we believe that recovery involves a family as well. Um, so a little bit about FORT. Um, the FORT program uses both um, an ecological and peer-based model to provide various recovery services for family members who have a loved one with a substance use disorder. This understanding will provide the families the strength needed to help them overcome these barriers through the utilization of community resources and a recovery plan that empowers the family's action and promotes health and wellness. So overall, our goal is to help stabilize the family and allow the family to gain their the support that they need as well. Um, so we offer individual counseling group, um, codependency groups, family counseling, couples counseling, any kind of support that the families may need. Um, we offer CRS and CFRS services and case management services who, um, allow, uh, access to other resources and can help um, identify what the family may need, whether maybe that's housing or psychiatrists or other whatever resources they, meet, they may need in the community. Um, and the beautiful part about this program in, is that it is um, county funded, um, so that's um, free of charge to the individuals. Um, so it is a wonderful um, addition to the community as well as the OASIS program, um, and we're able to offer those individual needs groups, like I said, couples, all that stuff. Um, so I, I want to leave some time for questions um, and yeah, answer any questions that you guys may have about the program. Are there any questions for Caitlin about Ford? I mean, I think their mission is very similar to what Rhonda's is, right? Yes. It's just a different, it's a different, the mission is absolutely the same. The goals and objectives are the same, just some different approaches. 